Okay, so we'll get started. Um, Risha Park Desante is currently a senior here at the Harker School, um, whose research attempts to combine a number of wide-ranging fields from linguistics to bioinformatics and quantum computing. In particular, Risha's current research interests lie at the intersection of creative applications of computing technologies with real-world problems. And through his most recent project, which he will be presenting on today, Rishab investigated how we can combine our computational knowledge, understanding of language with our knowledge of the human genome to preemptively predict and treat the progression of cancer. So for his work, Rishab was recognized as one of the top 40 finalists in the Regeneron Science Talent Search. Rishab's research also includes a published paper on hybrid quantum optical image recognition frameworks and other work on skin lesion recognition. Outside research, Risha loves solving puzzles, taking scenic drives around the bay, and contributing to making STEM education more accessible around the world, especially through his organization, the Online Physics Olympia. So with that, let's give a round of applause to Risha. Uh, thank you, Emily, for the introduction. And this is my project. And you can see the title here. So it's a novel combination of natural language processing and pathway analysis for predicting oncogenic mutation progression and recommending target therapies. So as we get in, I'm sure you've all heard about cancer, but just to quantify the problem that we're seeing with cancer in the US, even though we spent years doing chemotherapy, developing even therapies like gene therapy that are still in FDA trials and clinical trials, it still remains the second leading cause of death in the United States. And there are three main causes to this that doctors have identified. The first is that complex late-stage cancers often become untreatable or resistant by the time they reach that stage. And the problem with that is at least 25% of cancer is not caught early at all. And oftentimes, the cancers that are caught early are, un are impossible to treat without extremely invasive surgery. For example, glioblastomas in the brain, which might be inoperable at all. So to try to mitigate this problem, currently doctors use a three-tiered approach. And the first tier is regular physical exams. So in these exams, they identify any abnormalities in the patient's state, and they can then take that to the next step by performing whatever scans and biopsies are necessary. So right up there, you can see on the left side of the slide, there is a CT scan of the brain. And with the CT scan, you can identify where a brain tumor might be. On the left, on the, on the right, sorry, you have kind of a flow chart of how doctors might treat a thyroid cancer case. So they would take those physical exams, then go to the scans and biopsies, and finally, once they've got those scans and biopsies, the, step, the next step is evaluating not only the current prognosis, but also predicting how this cancer might progress one year down the line, five years down the line, because that is crucial for accurate treatment that can actually prevent these late-stage cancers from developing. But what are our current models doing that is failing to reach what doctors have? And what it is, is that current models are very concentrated on one step of this medical pipeline. They're all focused on this step of scans and biopsies. While physical exams may be hard for machine learning algorithms to really perform, we focus on analyzing, on the left, you can see image reconstruction or CT scan, well, the image on the right is looking at is how we analyze the current genomic state of a patient. And when I say that, that's kind of those bases A, C, G, and T that are the four bases of human of basically all life on Earth. So the problem with that is that progression is equally crucial part of what makes a cancer happen. And we haven't focused our efforts in computational biology on trying to figure out how we can evaluate that progression, how we can treat that progression. And that's where my research comes in. So for some background, our current genomic analysis focuses on two techniques. One is automated analysis using deep neural networks, and the other is target drugs or gene therapy, which is where we try to treat a specific gene in a patient that we think is kind of the driver, or would, and driver is a fancy biology term for the main cause of a patient's cancer. And one field that's trying to unify these two ideas is pathway analysis. So what pathway analysis does is it identifies 
biological pathways which are Think about them as connections between genes, connections between genes and proteins, and connections between these genes, proteins, and drugs. And you can see a sample example at, on the right side. You can see these circles are genes, and the red squares are drugs. And what these lines are showing is saying, in the cell, for example, the genes that are marked in yellow, you might be able to treat them using those drugs. While the connections between different pairs of genes might suggest that these two genes always occur in a certain sequence, or that there's some logic that we're seeing behind how these two genes are related. The issue with pathway analysis, though, is that it's completely reliant on manual processing of wet lab data. What that means is scientists have to work in the lab and manually process each sample, basically. So that's extremely time-consuming and costly. For example, this graph itself took more than five years to generate. On the other hand, we have natural language processing. And this is more of where the novelty of this project comes in. And specifically, I studied what are known as recurrent neural networks. So if you've heard about them, you probably know that they're not really used in genomics. They're actually used in linguistics and fields like stock market analyses. Because what they do is they learn correlations through time. For example, if you give it a sequence of a sentence, for example, it might learn how the fifth word in the sentence is related to the second word. And using that, it might be able to extrapolate grammar rules through time and order. And the key attributes that are key to my project are few-shot learning and attention. Few-shot learning means that these RNNs don't actually need very much data to train on, to learn from. Because what they can do is they actually look at pairwise between every single word or data point in these sequences. So that makes them extremely powerful. The second is attention. And attention is how these networks learn context. Because when you're in a recurrent neural network, when you're analyzing the 10th data point, you're not looking at the 10th data point alone. You're looking at everything from 1 to 10 and analyzing how we got to this point. What's, what's changed to make this happen? So I, I just saw here an opportunity to better model how doctors model pa diagnose patients by specifically focusing on this idea of disease progression through time and seeing if we could provide a, complete, a more complete framework for, saying, for projecting how cancer will progress and providing more systematic aid to patients. And to me, looking at these sequences of genes that are interrelated, it seemed to me almost like grammar rules that we see in our English language. For example, if you for writing a sentence, you might say, if I have a conjunction like and, I always need to have a comma around it. But genomically, you might say, I've always seen gene A mutating right before gene B. So who's to say that I can't predict that gene B were the one will, be, will mutate right after gene A in the future? In that way, I, I kind of thought of these genes as a language in and of themselves. So my idea was to develop a natural language processing inspired technique for creating these pathway analyses pathway analyses in order to decode this genetic language of life and reduce the burden of cancer on patients. So for my, and this is just a flowchart of an overall framework, I'll get more in depth on each of these parts, but there's really three steps to the work I've done. I've done. The first is data processing. I use a data set known as TCGA and I pre-processed it to identify relevant genes and mutations. And once that was complete was the next phase, the network phase. In the network phase, I trained the model, my RNN model, on these sequences of genes that I was extracting. And finally, in the result processing, in the result processing I did three things. I predicted the prognosis, i.e. the cancer stage from the training set, and I tested on the testing set. I probabilistically determined kind of which mutations might happen next in a given patient's cancer. And third, developed a database pipeline for taking those mutations that I predicted and seeing if we can preemptively treat them with existing treatments. So for the first step is data pre-processing. And as I said, I worked with a TCGA data set, which is the, the Cancer Genome Atlas. It's the largest open source cancer genomics data set, and it works. And what I did is I analyzed each class with more than 300 patients. And to generate these mutation sequences that I addressed, 
I use multiple time points. For example, if there are multiple biopsies and genetic analyses performed, I'll use those as multiple time points to quantify the sequence. And if not, I'll use cancer stage. For example, this is a method that's become more prominent in the past two years. But if we think about it, cancer stage one normally comes before stage two, comes before stage three, comes before stage four. So even if we don't know the exact time at which these mutations occur, if we know at what stage these mutations occur, we can come up with a pseudo time sequence. On the other hand, I also had to pre-process my mutations because only 16.8% of mutations occurred in more than 1% of patients. And these, that such mutations are also more clinically significant. So this allows the network to learn without doing what's called as overfitting, which is when the network memorizes a certain data set and just goes from there, which is something especially dangerous because the network is basically going out of control. So for the implementation, I evaluated the top expressed mutations. And what expression means is how frequently the mutation occurs, and also how frequently the proteins that the mutation creates are, are found in the cell. Because there's two stages. The mutation has to be present, and it actually has to be used as well. So those are the two phases of expression that I use. And I determined the most, the most expressed mutations, and I weighted the data set using these genomic sequences. For the network architecture, I use a model architecture built using a recurrent neural network. It's actually inspired based on an NLP or natural language processing model known as ALMO, just like the Sesame Street character. Um, and what it does is the first step is what's known as embedding, the E in ALMO. And what this does is it learns word context and mutation context through time. And instead of using words, I actually trained this from scratch on my genomic sequence. So what this is doing is learning biologically unique correlations and learning relatedness between pairs of mutations. The next step, or the RNN step, is what's known as long short-term memory units. And what these do is you can see the diagram in the bottom right corner. It actually feeds data both forward and backwards. So it's processing all time points at the same time both forward and backwards. That could seem a bit paradoxical, but what this allows it to do is that forward pass allows it to learn the context of what's happened in the past in this like sequence and connect those to future steps, while the backwards step actually helps it smooth those predictions. And the idea of smoothing seems a bit weird. What, just think about it as you don't want to over overcorrect for past time steps. So you're not like overcorrecting. So that just helps balance, create a balance between current and past. The final step really is gene drug predictions. And as you can see here, once I got the stage prediction from the RNN, using the data from the pre-processing algorithm, which identify mutation expression rates, and also mutation expression rates in with specific with other mutations occurring. So I might say, if the gene BRCA1 is mutated, PIK3CA is expressed double more often than in non-BRCA1 positive patients. Then I might say, if I see a BRCA1 patient without PIK3CA, I could say pick 3 c is very possible to occur. And that's what I mean by probabilistically predicting which mutation would occur in the future. And using those, I was, those predicted mutations, I was able to query both the drug bank and BPS IUFAR drug databases. And the drug bank is the one that's operating off the FDA and Canadian standards, while BPS IUFAR is working off EU standards and EU and UK standards. So what these do is provide me a double validation step to make sure that the medications that I'm recommending are extremely robust to these treatments. Because especially when you're working on a technology that has to go to human patients, it's crucial that you take into account mitigating the possible side effects that your technology might create. So now we can look at the results for predicting stage. And these curves are what are known as rock curves, or receiver operating characteristic curves. So in all these curves, you see the bright blue line kind of going down. And what this diagonal line represents is random guessing. So that's a model that just does not know any of the stages and guesses randomly. So for each of these cancer types, you can see that the rock curves are significantly above that line indicating random guessing. What that means is it's learning robust correlations, and it's also able to actually figure out kind of prognosis, which is actually a major step forward because we had not been able to identify the dichotomy between severity and prognosis before now. And 
The difference there is severity is saying this is an aggressive cancer versus this is a less aggressive cancer. While prognosis is saying right now, this more aggressive cancer might still not have reached a state of metastasis, for example. Or this less severe cancer has reached this state where it's, we need to treat it now. And that's what allows us to kind of deepen our understanding of these biological systems. Also, we see the effectiveness of the pre-processing algorithm. And we actually find that pre-processing works best when there's around 200 mutations that you're processing per stage. Now, this might seem like a pretty arbitrary number, but it's actually very telling, because in wet lab biological research that's been performed, bi biologists have actually identified that there may be only 200 of these key driver mutations for specific types of cancer. So this 200 mutation number is, is not just some arbitrary number that's been tested or found. It's something that's backing up the biological research that we have now and also validating some of the claims of this model as consistent with these wet lab researchers. For, to validate the gene drug predictions now, you, you can see these heat maps. And what these heat maps are, are kind of each, you can look at the y-axis, the vertical axis, that's the cancer stage of the patient. And the x-axis is the gene, the mutate, gene that's getting mutated. And each square indicates the probability that a certain gene would be predicted as going to occur in a, in a patient, in the future of a patient with a certain cancer stage. Now, some of these are very famous genes, like pig 3 ca being the most expressed, most predicted in breast cancer. This is very, but there are some that are unexpected. For example, in late stage breast cancer, you can see CDH1, that bright red square in the bottom row, that's highly clear late stage breast cancer, but not early stage. So actually, and similarly in head and neck cancer, you can see a similar progression for cdk 2 and A, which is further on the right side. These are two genes that we hadn't really associated with cancer up until the past five years. But recently, we've begun to see them more as indicators that a cancer might be stepping it up, might be going from a less aggressive early stage cancer to a rapid mutation to an extremely aggressive late stage cancer. So what this, mod what this shows is this model is actually producing novelties that are on the cutting edge of biological research today. Because this analysis of progression actually allows it to identify the unexpected nature of where these massive changes in mutation progression and cancer progression are occurring. So as for a discussion, as compared to the current models, even though RNN is a relatively simple model, by analyzing these mutation progression sequences for the, progression, for the prediction of prognosis and stage, it's actually as, ac as accurate as cutting edge models, such as those produced, predicted by Kwan et al, that are, more than, that are more than 50 times more complex than the model I use. And that's, and even compared to oncologists, there's the, the points to the fact that this could be a useful tool for valuing disease progression. However, there are still some flaws that need to be improved. On one hand, melanoma was actually the cancer that was the outlier with only 48% accuracy. And what this really indicates is that these types of cancer, that these types of cancer that are more implicated with external factors, like UV radiation in the case of melanoma, need these factors to be taken into account to more accurately predict these cancer types. Also, we need larger, more equitable data sets because TCGA is relatively biased in its distribution of patients, both racially and in gender, to really bring this to scale and make it fair for the general public. So to conclude, my study was the first to apply this natural language processing inspired paradigm to a genomic pathway analysis problem. And I, it's my hope that this end-to-end -end efficient RNN pipeline for predicting cancer severity, projecting cancer progression, and recommending treatments can unlock the future of predicting future mutation progression, being able to treat those future mutations even before they happen without the need for wet lab analysis that takes years. And more so than that, just generally, this is a proof of concept for, a, and for just an NLP-inspired approach to, a, to any genomic problem. So in the future, this model, I believe, can actually be applied to any genetically correlated disease, not just cancer. Take Alzheimer's, for example, cystic fibrosis. 
These are all diseases where time has also been implicated in the progression of mutations that cause the rapid progression and deterioration of patients with these diseases. And who's to say that these kind of models with their potential in cancer might not do the same for those diseases? And in doing so, since especially also the RNA gives it a high level of efficiency, I believe it can also be then extended to a, tool, a possible helpful diagnostic tool and treatment tool for doctors to use. And especially with more wet lab analyses to ver verify this RNA with, and also analytical me metrics to extract this black box of what this AI model we don't know too much about is learning we can unlock kind of more understanding of the fundamental biology about how cancer evolves that might be able to transform our understanding of how we design treatments, how we deliver treatments to patients, and overall just the paradigm of cancer treatment as a whole. And I'd like to thank my mentor for this project, Dr. Achin Baumik at Stanford University. And I'd also like to thank my research mentors at Harker, Doc Nelson and Mr. Spenner, for making this possible, along with Ms. Chetty and the Harker Research Program for hosting me here today. We're a little over time, but we have a good amount of questions, so we'll just take the top two questions. The first one being, what was your main motivation for this project? Yeah, so my main motivation for this project is I've been having done a computational biology project in freshman year. I actually worked with diagnosing skin lesions based on kind of the reductive biopsy lenses that I had talked about. But what I had found is that while it worked very well for that time set, it couldn't really tell me how do I treat this patient? What can I do five years, ten years down the line? And the, I think the especially important part of that is when I came to learn genomics more and more in, in when I got to later years of high school, I found that it was really similar to kind of language puzzles and anagrams that I played with like a kid, as a kid. Like the A, C, G, and T, and these genes that I was seeing just intuitively worked to me as kind of a language of sorts. Because if you think about it, what is language? Language is just a combination of words with some fundamental grammar rules that allows us to say, how do we build a sentence? How do we build a paragraph? And if we're putting these DNA bases into order, if we're putting these genes into order based on how they evolve in cancer, based on these biological pathways, you can actually, you could, I just thought of these mutations as these words and pathways as almost the grammar that we're placing them into. And that's what led me into exploring this whole world of natural language processing and applying it to genomics. Awesome. And one more question, and we can just get through this really quickly. But uh, apart from clinical applications, how helpful will RNNs be in research on cancer progression? Yeah, so I think RNNs, because they're so general of a methodology, they actually work on any data set with time series data. Now, of course, today, what we have the most of is we have the most time series data on genomics because that's where we really spend a lot of time analyzing biopsies of patients, having RNA-seq data done to figure out what mutations have occurred. But in the future, of course, as we get more data, maybe image sequences over time or MRI scans, over time, RNNs will also be crucial to analyzing those frameworks as well. So really any type of progression you're seeing, not just clinical, that's where RNNs can be productive. Also, I think in my discussion, I presented a model, I discussed the models from Quan et al. that are actually using a combination of what is known as a GAN, or generative adversarial network, with these other neural networks. I think that what GANs do actually is they kind of try to beat the model by like generating fake data that I think will, the model will fail on. And I think in the future, if we are able to combine these GANs with RNNs, that might be the cutting edge of how we analyze cancer progression. That by being able to extrapolate just beyond these cancer sequences we have, who's to say that we might be able to predict cancer pathways before we even find them in a biological cell and say, this is a treatment that we might not have even found in, might not have even found yet, and this is something that we need to study immediately. 
Awesome. Let's give one more round of applause to Rousseau.